You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. Talking Mondays. Talking Mondays. Happy Monday. This is Mondays at the Overhead Wire, sponsored by our generous Patreon supporters. I'm Jeff Wood, your host, and joined by Han Solo. That's right. It's another solo show, but I want to encourage folks to go back and listen to last Monday, the last Monday's episode with Joe and Aaron, if you haven't already. Also, we've got a great episode coming next week with Chrissy and a special guest, so stay tuned for that one. And this week on Thursday's Talking Headways, we'll be joined by Christopher Pulchowski, Hopefully I said that right, Christopher. I think I messed it up in the first time. (laughs) And Andrew Simpson from the Philadelphia Office of Transportation and Sustainability, Otis Office at Philadelphia. We'll talk about some of the regional rail plans that that are coming up, um, some of the really cool initiatives that they're going to talk about. And uh, we'll have some bonus Patreon material coming out with them as well. So stay tuned if you're a Patreon supporter to those pages. And I think we had a Carol Martin's one up now with some extra an extra hour, I believe, of content uh, with Carol from the last time we chatted with him. And we're going to have some more coming up as I've started to do a little bit of bonus stuff with folks as they come through the podcast scene. So check that out if you get a chance. And I hope that folks get a chance to listen next Monday. Uh, with Chrissy and then the uh, Thursday with Talking Headways. So solo show today, but we've got some really good stuff coming up for you as well. Not that this show should be diminished at all. There's lots of stuff to talk about. Um, And for how things are going a little bit more generally with me, uh, I got my first vaccine shot and I'll get my second one in a couple of weeks. I'm super excited about that and to get that over with. I'm not a huge I'm not a huge fan of needles. Uh, For folks that know me, they know that giving blood, needles, all that stuff is just freaks me out. I think maybe that some of my side effects from the vaccine were from some needle anxiety a little bit. Um, though I had a a bit of a sore arm for, for like one day maybe, uh, and then it went back to normal. But if you're on the fence about getting a vaccine, definitely go and do it. You're protecting yourself, you're protecting others, and it's highly likely you'll be able to go out and have beers with friends much, much, much sooner. So, um, don't worry about the needle. It actually, even from a a needle phobe (laughs) like myself, it wasn't as bad as I thought it might be. So, Uh, definitely something to get done if you can get that done or if you haven't had it done already. Uh, This is episode 88, Shut-Ins Anonymous 101 is in session. And before we get to the show, I want to let folks know that they can get this podcast wherever you find your podcasts, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, and of course, Apple Podcasts. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And subscribing means that you get both Mondays at the Overhead Wire and Talking Headways on the same feed. Two fun podcasts, one great channel. So thanks to folks to who subscribe through Podcatchers. It's really awesome that you guys keep coming back to the show. We really, really do appreciate it. So with that being said, uh, let's go to the news. This is part of the show where we talked about some news items from the Overhead Wire newsletter that were popular. So people uh, subscribe to the newsletter. They click on items that they're interested in reading about, and we take the most clicked items and we turn them into some stories for you all. And uh, so let's talk about a couple today. $200,000 and no permit. So Jason Yu has spent $200,000 with nothing to show for it but an empty storefront and has now given up his dream of opening an ice cream shop in San Francisco. Permitting and planning bureaucracy in the city are preventing small businesses from opening in parts of the city with high storefront vacancies. It was hoped that a proposition that passed in November would help expedite permitting, but only two businesses have applied. That was by Heather Knight at the San Francisco Chronicle. So this is insane. Uh, We have had so many empty storefronts in San Francisco that aren't being filled up because of the stupid process. We did pass Prop H last fall, which would force the city to complete most permit reviews in 30 days and limit the notifications for certain permits. But as I just said, only two businesses have applied for that. I hope more will get a chance. Um, But ultimately, it's not enough at the moment to get some of these businesses going. And now this person, Jason Yu, is out $200,000 of just paying rent to the building owner. I hope he gets kind of a discount on that because that's you know, that kind of uh, is not really <laughs> good. Uh, I, I don't know how that all works, but it's unfortunate that he basically had a space. He had a business idea. 
Uh, and, but don't even get me started on the ice cream shop across the street that made him get a lawyer and an extra trip to the planning commission. So I don't understand why they don't understand the benefits of agglomeration. It could have been the ice cream, ice cream district, not the diamond district, the ice cream district in San Francisco at over there at, I think it was like 20th in Valencia or something along those lines, but it's really frustrating. You know, there's a bunch of, uh, empty storefronts on the street, uh, that I live by and it's just frustrating to see them always empty all the time. And even some of the stores that have been there, like shoe shops or anything else, they have gone by the wayside. Some places are even leaving San Francisco. They were doing, you know, some of them were doing so before the pandemic, but, um, you know, it's, it's some of the, the store owners, I guess, or feel like they can get more rent. And so these places sit empty for a long time as they're waiting for their unicorn. There's a place on the corner of the street up, up the hill here that, um, wants to sell, I think it's medical marijuana, but they, uh, put up uh, a sign saying that they they had to apply and then it all disappeared and I haven't seen anything from it since and it's been like six months to a year so I don't know I don't know what the deal is with the storefronts and I hope that some of this stuff can get fixed because it's ridiculous I mean we say that we're opening and welcome and we want people to come here to San Francisco and enjoy the city but then we don't let people start businesses so how are we supposed to you know get anything done that way so it's frustrating Okay, next up, saving cities from super gentrification. Sociologist Jenny Stuber writes in her new book about how Aspen, Colorado has created a parallel affordable housing market in a place where the median home price is around $4 million. She also discusses a building moratorium to quell super gentrification that involves height limits and public space requirements. This is by Phineas Ruckert at Next City. Um, so this was a really super interesting read. Uh, Jenny talks about, you know, kind of going to visit her, her dad in, uh, Aspen when she was younger and the kind of the bifurcated nature of housing in the city. And they have affordable housing for people who live there, but then there's just this crazy market for rich people who come to stay for the summer or have a, a, a winter house for skiing or whatever that might be. Um, it's just kind of a crazy, crazy thing that happens there. Basically none of the buildings have changed in town. But they saw that they were buildings getting purchased that were a few stories tall, and the top would be a penthouse, and the bottom would be nothing. So they had uh, affordable housing for local residents, like I mentioned, but then this problem with gentrification on gentrification on gentrification, um, which is why those bottom floors were now are now required to have regular type businesses. But look, anyone telling you that our building uh, problem or problem generally with housing is too much uh, for the rich never seems to see this coming even though there's proof everywhere that we need to build more housing. I'm not advocating necessarily. You've heard me on the show many times say, I want affordable housing. I want uh, public housing. I'd like uh, market rate housing, all of it. Let's do all of it. But it seems like nobody can get their their stuff together to to get it going. I know there's restrictions and things that happen uh, here in San Francisco and, and all over the country that make it hard. And uh, there's even like now with the pandemic, there's this mad dash for housing. Uh, in the suburbs and even in cities around the country. I think New York and San Francisco are a bit of outliers, but it's crazy that we have this problem. And, um, you know, this problem kind of is amplified in places like Aspen, where there's a lot of rich people that want to go to a place and there is a bifurcated market. It's really, it's really interesting to read this piece. I hope folks get a chance to check it out. Um, next city we'll have, as usual, have all this, the, the notes and the show notes, we'll have all of the links that folks can click through to kind of get you to read the whole article. But, um, you know, like I said, the rich will always outbrid everybody else to the detriment of an entire building or an entire block in a city. And uh, that's just the frustrating part about what capitalism is. It allows people to do that. And we need that public housing. We need that um, that housing for for folks that can't afford to pay as much as maybe some other folks. And Hopefully we can get there at some point. So check this piece out. It's interesting, uh, an interesting look at a city in a case study in the United States uh, that's not Vienna and it's not somewhere else outside. Just fascinating. Uh, and speaking of housing, a housing plan in the Senate, a, bipar- a bipartisan proposal from the Senate spearheaded by Sen- Senator Amy Klobuchar would offer $300 million in grants for small and medium-sized cities to reform zoning in a way that allows for more housing production. Many smaller cities don't have the in-house expertise to create such reforms, but some experts are skeptical as many cities that have the resources don't want to go through the process. So this is by Jerusalem Demsas in Vox. So what I, under- what I don't understand if this makes sense, it's not for your bigger cities, but rather for the smaller ones that don't want to turn out like the big ones. So I've been telling everyone who will listen for years that Austin, for example, is becoming San Francisco. And if they continue to restrict development downtown and in the core neighborhoods, it's going to get really ugly really fast. And I think you're starting to see some of that now, just this really crazy price hikes um, when you don't build housing, as we talked about in the previous discussion. Um, 
But for much smaller cities, it would be nice to have a universal code that's designed uh, to blow up the existing code of, you know, of, of sprawl and single family housing and get people some sort of a form based code or some sort of a way to build missing middle housing. Um, and a lot of the aesthetic stuff that, for example, that or go into those codes that aren't necessary or and are kind of dumb uh, should just be taken out. I mean, there's a lot of stuff where people want to protect the neighborhood character or whatever, but we've cycled through all this stuff before zoning so many times before, and it seems like there's no reason to not get with the program and actually build more housing. I've said this many times, kind of sick of saying it over and over again. You know, if a house takes up four units on the same footprint of one unit, who cares aside from all the busybodies? Let's just get it done, do it, build more housing, and, uh, you know, maybe we, maybe I'll stop complaining on the podcast about it. Next up, people working from home will spend less downtown. The University of Chicago researchers have uh, believe that spending in cities will drop up to 10% because more people will be working from home. The changes don't bode well for businesses that depend on downtown workers and foretell an uneven economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. This is by Ben Wink in Business Insider. I mean, this is true if we have a lot more people working from home, right? Um, but we really don't know what's going to happen. It could be a situation where people who usually just went home after work will now stick around more, maybe. Uh, if they're only coming to the office three days a week, maybe they'll stick around downtown and spend more money. Or from a traffic perspective, I wonder uh, if this is not based in, you know, this is not based in science. It's just my thinking out loud. Um, but I wonder if people, uh, because there are more people working from home, there will be an even greater need for transit service because the increased traffic, uh, because more people think that they'll be able to drive. I think that, you know, when you have these shorter work weeks and people are like, oh, I'm just coming to the office three times a week, it's possible that everybody thinks they'll be able to drive because they're, it's like, it's like a coming in on a Saturday or something, but it's not, it's going to be even worse because if everybody's driving, then you don't have any access, uh, to the roads because of all the people that are driving. So it seems kind of silly, um, to think that maybe something will be different after the pandemic, just because a few more people are working from home. Now, again, this is not based in science. This is not something I've seen in any research. It's just this idea I have of, we're not quite sure what's going to happen afterwards. So we shouldn't be kind of laying our chips down and focusing on certain strategies quite yet. I think we need to think about what might be coming, but I also think we need to kind of lay off on the pontificating a little bit. But given the research that was discussed in the article, you know, 10% is a fair amount of reduction in, in, in business in these downtown areas. But I honestly don't know if that's actually going to be the case or not. I'd like to think that it wasn't the case because I really do like downtown areas and I hope they stay strong. Um, but you know, we aren't quite sure what's going to happen. So, um, I could see some really weird scenarios coming out of the post pandemic world. Um, I'd be interested to hear everybody else's thoughts too. Like, what do you think might actually happen from a, just a, um, hypothetical standpoint. What do you think might happen? I, I've said this before, I think a few times that I'm not sure. So I don't know if I can make any predictions. So, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens, but that's an interesting research. It's five, 10, five to 10% 5 to might be reduced in, in downtown business. But that also feeds into this next piece, which is rethinking commuter rail service post pandemic. It's unknown whether commuters will return to offices at the same level as before the pandemic, but whether they do or don't, it gives transit agencies the ability to rethink regional rail for trips that don't involve a workday commute. Some commuter railways are already looking at opportunities to operate more like rapid transit. This is by Jake Bloomgart at Governing. Uh, Jake is a great writer. Uh, hopefully f more folks check this piece out. This one got a ton of uh, clicks on it. People were really interested in this story. And it's also perfect timing for our discussion with Philly folks on Thursday. So if you're interested in the regional rail discussion uh, at places like um, in Philly, like uh, what they're trying to think about doing in SEPTA or MBTA, um, definitely take a take a listen on Thursday and see what you see what you think. Um, <laughs> you can maybe hear the dog barking in the background. That's Mary upstairs and uh, uh, she must have uh, must be seeing something, some ghosties, as my mom would say. But for this regional rail piece, I think that um, you know we're seeing some interesting numbers come out of the pandemic from transit. We've seen that, for example, on Mission Street, Muni um, is back up to like I think seventy five percent of previous ridership. At least that's what I saw on a number on tra on um, on Twitter today. I think it was uh, the Greater Marin. Um, who, who, who mentioned this uh, at, at the greater Marin on Twitter. 
Um, which is really interesting because th- that's a really key corridor in places like San Francisco. I think there's probably many other key corridors in cities that are, are, are still kind of hopping along because of the people that they serve. They're not serving a commute per se, but they're serving, you know, people that have to get to where they're going for other trips, not necessarily work. And so these commuter rail services are all built around the work commute. And what happens in, when you lose your workers is you'll lose that whole process. I'm hoping that we start to rethink the commute in a way that's more sustainable for transit in that you have all day service. That's pretty, um, you know, pretty good service. It serves a lot of people. It's actually more frequent. It's actually kind of more spaced evenly out during the day, um, and not necessarily catering towards work trips. Cause that work trip, it's such a weird trip because it's twice a day, but then it's only like 19% of trips. That number might've changed since the last time I looked up the number, but around there, 19, 20% or so. Um, and, you know, so you still have those 80% of trips that are out there that other people are taking. And, um, we focus so much, so many people take that work trip at the same time that it kind of clogs up our decision-making and our planning. So let's think about it a little bit differently. I hope this, uh, you know, regional rail, they should think about, you know, doing more rapid transit type stuff. I think BART is kind of the same way where really we should start thinking about five, 10 minute service everywhere rather than these 15, 30 minute service on Sundays type of thing, because, you know, it might be regional rail, but it's also in the core. I think people use it more like rapid transit, um, and what that should be. So I know BART's kind of a commuter system, but there's other systems that actually could be useful if they go to, um, you know, and I, and I sometimes, you know, equate bar, even though it is a subway and it's kind of this weird amalgamation of commuter rail and subway system. But, you know, these places like MD, MBTA and, and SEPTA, which have actual regional rail, even, a, a, you know, um, Chicago and Metro, you know, they get, to, they get to a point where they need to, you know, kind of increase service. They have really good lines. They can actually get to 10 minute, 15 minute headways. That would actually be a benefit. And I think that'd be really interesting to see what happens. So anyways, check up our discussion on Thursday about that a little bit more. That's going to be really interesting. But this piece in governing really kind of, I think, got a lot of people's attention. And finally, uh, how the Greyhound bus links America. The inner city bus industry in the United States served 16 million riders in 2019. But during the pandemic, the industry laid off or furloughed 80% of its workforce. If we lost the bus industry, we might lose a democratic connection between a cross-section of the American people. That's by Sonam Vashi in National Geographic. Uh, a really good article. I hope folks get a chance to read this one too. So there's been a lot of discussion about high-speed rail or even making Amtrak work correctly, but those regional rail lines only hit some of the city pairs people would like to travel to in the United States. And honestly, the inner city bus does a good job of connecting people in a way that really Amtrak or even high-speed rail can't uh, now unless there was a massive China-scale investment coming, which I honestly don't see. But the but the Greyhound bus is a major part of, of that. And honestly, it's a little bit classist, I think, that everyone was talking about the airlines and they got so much ha- a huge bailout uh, and when actually city buses and inner city buses really do so much of the work. So, you know, sure, it's a different trip type, but we need to kind of have a better discussion about this. And I think uh, a better discussion about access and need. But I, I think it's, you know, those those trips that people take on inner city buses um, are necessary. People need to get between towns, between cities, and have make those stops in it, you know, going all of the places that I guess the interstate highway system takes people. But maybe if you don't have a car, you don't have access to. Um, and then, it, you know, and maybe an, an Amtrak won't take you uh, uh, otherwise, or even the uh, a flight probably definitely won't take you because of the way that the flights are set up in the United States. So it's really interesting to think about that type of service uh, from that perspective, uh, thinking about it more kind of as a part of the larger uh, network of transportation in the United States. I think that that's something we need to really think about. Um, I know that there's some folks that are thinking about inner city buses. You know, if they look it back at, they've looked been looking back at historical bus networks in cities and to see where the buses actually served and where they don't serve now and how much we've lost since the 50s and 60s, which were, you know, there was a way more bus service back then. Um, it's really interesting to think about, and hopefully we can get back to a network of, of service that can take people to, to where they want to go. Another thing I wanted to note that's kind of related to this generally is that we heard recently about how France is going to cut down on flights that can be taken by high-speed rail instead through restrictions. Uh, now Lufthansa and Deutsche Bahn are uh, doing the same thing and want to offer rail trips instead of flights in Germany for you know 4.3 million or 20% of the trips a year in that in that category. And so I, I, I hope this is something that we can do. Now, we can't do it necessarily with rail because we don't have the infrastructure yet. Uh, and it's probably a long time off, if I'm being honest. But, you know, perhaps we will in the future. And it, and it shows that 
the levels of investments that were behind versus other countries um, is is a lot. And it, to make these types of decisions that will affect emissions, which is you know kind of part of the goal is to reduce emissions and make things more efficient. But we're up against that climate change wall, and I think that we need to kind of get to that point where we can make these. Um, these pushes. And I think that's part of the reason why California's high-speed rail makes so much sense to me is because you can't build any more runways in San Francisco or Los Angeles. I know that people want to talk about the Central Valley and what's going on there, but the ultimate connection is between that huge city pair of San Francisco and Los Angeles and all the connections you can make along the way. I mean, Bakersfield is one um, that I would actually frequent because my sister lives there. But you know, these are really important discussions to have. And I, maybe those buses, uh, you know, those inner city buses are the way to kind of make those connections. And, uh, you know, I don't think anytime soon that we're going to be cutting out air trips for in trading for inner city buses because they just don't go as fast. But um, it's something that I hope we think about in the future because we are coming up against a wall on climate change. And these are really big decisions that are being made by by Lufthansa and Deutsche Bahn and uh, SNCF, which is the French high-speed rail company and, and Air France. So I hope that, um, you know, that kind of catches on, but you have to have that network uh, available to actually do that. So uh, lots of interesting stuff in the last few weeks. I hope, um, you know, folks get a chance to check some of these links out. It's, uh, that's this week's news. So let's do a real quick shout out to our Patreon supporters. So this week and every week, I want to thank our generous Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome and keep the show going by listening and supporting each month. And this show and Talking Headways really wouldn't be here without it. So thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate it. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash the overhead wire if, you, if you're interested and inclined in doing so. We've had people sign up each month during the pandemic. So we're super appreciative of that. $2 a month will get you some stickers and a $10 a month will get you a bus only scarf. That's right. We have the bus only scarves and uh, we're sending them out. So uh, I know it's getting towards the end of uh, of the cold period in the United States, but um, but maybe you can get some for next year, or maybe you live in the San Francisco and it's cold all year round because of the fog. Who knows? But they're really good for meetings and public meetings and those types of things. So so if you want one of our bus only scarves, you can get that uh, in addition to being a ten dollars month supporter on Patreon by going to the website theoverheadwire.com. I also want to mention that we did produce an audiobook version of Raymond Unwin's 1909 classic, Town Planning and Practice. Uh, if you want to get your hands on one, go to RaymondUnwin.com. This book was super fun to produce, and if you're a History of Planning fan, it's the very first one listed on the American Planning Association's 100 Essential Books of Planning. So we had a lot of fun putting that together. We we hope that folks will take a listen. It's like listening to a podcast. Each chapter is a new is a new episode on a podcast. If you go to um, the if you go to the RaymondUnwin.com and purchase from there, uh, we really appreciate that. And and uh, hopefully the, some folks will listen because I think it's a really good text. Okay, so listener questions and comments. So we didn't have a listener question for this week, but I'm going to save it because I think that it will be more fun having Chrissy's answer in there as well next week. So we'll hear from that one next week. Um, but feel free to send questions and comments to on any of the topics we cover, uh, or you can do so by emailing me at theoverheadwire at gmail.com. And if you have any comments or questions, feel free to tweet at us or comment on any of the social sites where the podcast appears. And finally, as you have come to expect puppies and butterflies, this is the part of the show where we talk about something fun, interesting, or maybe it just didn't fit in the other sections. Okay, so let's get down to the serious stuff, uh, or not so serious. (laughs) So I've noticed lately that in the Netherlands, uh, there's been really some, some strange news lately. The first one I noticed and I posted on my Twitter feed was this image of a huge super yacht traveling through a Dutch canal and going out on its way to sea. And so apparently the Dutch shipyard is inland, so the yacht needs to be towed through some small Dutch town canals. And on its way through, there's a number of people that have taken pictures of this weird juxtaposition between the yacht, which is for the ultra-rich, obviously, and these small Dutch towns, uh, these buildings that are obviously, um, they're they're prototypically Dutch architecture, and it's really fascinating to see these things. So um, I'll put that link in the show notes, but I thought that was really fascinating to see that. Um, and, and it's kind of Dutch day here at, at Puppies and Butterflies because the second thing I saw uh, recently was from actually today where um, a floating farm in the Netherlands continues to have cows falling overboard into the water. 
And uh, <laughs> I think that's kind of funny. They they survived. They're okay, which makes it even you know, which makes it okay. I think to laugh a little bit, but. Um, this is likely to be a hazard for any of those future seafaring city plan scenarios that we have, uh, you know, uh, floating out there, uh, no pun intended. Um, so I can just see like a specialized cow lift for whenever the cows fall in the water. Um, and uh, it's funny because the fireman who had to help lift this cow to the water said, you know, they've, they've done a lot of animals, but mostly it's cats out of trees, not uh, cows out of the water. And uh, I think that's pretty funny. So the farmer says that the cows have to be rescued from lakes and regular and regular water on land too. So who knows if this is actually a normal occurrence for them rescuing cows and such. But um, if we ever get to that water world type of scenario, you have this uh, kind of a weird problem of cows falling off your off your farmland. Um, just some weird stuff. So, anyways, uh, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the Overhead Wire or at theoverheadwire.com. Thank you for joining us at Mondays at the Red Wire, and thanks to our generous Patreons for supporting this week's podcast and every week's podcast. We really appreciate your support. Next week, we've got a great show, so come back next Monday, and we'll see you on Thursday as well. Talking.